I'm the owner and founder of Zilvardos um, in Olympia, Washington. I'm a tiny house builder, and I am here live to answer your questions about building tiny houses. Um, so, please shoot them to me. Um, move this around a little bit so the light is not right in the camera. Well, maybe I can just... Hold on, I'll turn that off. Like it. Um, anyway, so I'm back. Um, last week I was uh, feeling a little sick. Um, it took a while to get over that. Um, everybody had the flu around here. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, back in the shop and um, building again, of course, and uh, I have a few things on the workbench today. Um, so I'm going to start with that. Um, move this. Let's see what we got. Have a wood stove <laughs> from uh, these are made by an English company. Um, they're very cool, um, and I am assembling it today because I'm going to test this later on. Um, let's see. Okay, looks like we're doing okay. So I'll start in. Um, wood stoves and tiny houses. I'll talk about that really briefly because a lot of people actually ask me about these. Um, about wood stoves, that is. Um, it is wood stove is kind of uh, a risky element to add to a house. Um, there's a lot to it, and it's not as easy as sticking a pipe through the ceiling. And... Um, you know, putting a stove on the end of it and starting it up. They uh, have a, a lot of, uh, there is a bit of complication to getting a wood stove to work properly. And if they don't work properly, they can um, at the least not operate well or efficiently. And at the worst, they can burn down your house. So wood stoves should always be regarded with a lot of respect. Um, it's just kind of the way it is. Um, even more than, you know, your electrical wiring and um, such. Um, this wood stove is really well packed. Um, this comes from, I believe it's made in England, um, but they're now, they, they now have North American dealers for these um, and in the States, you know, before you could get them through Canada, but um, this is a, a Hobbit <laughs> and uh, they're really well made. Um, very impressed by their workmanship and um, it's simple and it's well put together. Anyway, I'm just kind of assembling one here. Uh, I'm taking out the parts. Um, what I'm looking for is legs first. My air compressor always starts when I get online. So let's see. Um, Link some of the parts out. So I, oh, this one's anchored. Okay, that's great. Um, sometimes the, there are plates inside that you have to pull out because when you turn it over, they'll kind of bang around in there. have a, today I have a new tool bag, and it's right here, um, it's, uh, again, it's a Husky, um, you know, I don't really advocate for any particular brand, but, um, the, uh, Husky makes decent tool bags, <laughs> sorry, off camera, and so I've been, uh, running them for a while, they last, um, there are some other good tool bags around though, so it's not, again, it's not, I don't recommend any particular brands, but 
sometimes there's something that works, and I don't mind mentioning it anyway. Um, here are the feet. They do have bolts in them now. Oh my gosh, this is so great. They give you bolts so you can bolt the stove down. Uh, that's amazing for a, a tiny house, honestly. Um, uh, they didn't used to have that. Good on you guys. Um, love great engineering. It's just what it's all about. Um, okay, here we go. Pardon me. It's been really cold here in Olympia, Washington um, for quite a while, uh, which is kind of amazing and astounding. Um, okay, these are the leg bolts. Leg, leg, not lag. Um, and washers. That. They look like they're all the same. And, and let's see. Just, oh, come on, guys. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna have to start with one and run it in and out of the holes. The holes are a little burry. Um, so let's see. It doesn't look like I have anybody on, which is interesting. Huh. But, oh, okay. Well, if you're out there, <laughs> Um, so I'm gonna take my socket and my impact driver, and then I need the adapter. It looks like this. Impact driver on one end, square socket drive on the other. That works. Um, here we go. Maybe they made this so you can't open it with gloved hands. <laughs> okay. One. My sockets in this, you can't open it. Okay, there we go, and I will find the right one, just like that. One half inch, of course, and there we go. So I'm just going to, um, okay, that works, so I know this is gonna work. So, uh, Impact drivers and small sockets are just kind of a match made in heaven. Um, you are assembling something, you know, there's the old <laughs> socket wrench, but um, for the assembly, you know, you can get more torque ultimately with one of those, but for the assembly part, uh, impact driver is just the cat's meat. Okay, these holes aren't as burry as I thought. They're actually pretty well made. Yeah, no, that's good. So we're all set. Um, so onward. Um, it's important to be careful when lining up bolts because they'll cross. There, see, it's turning a cross thread right there. And so what that means is that I'm going to start it by hand with uh, one of these. Oops, that's not the right one. There we go. Like this. There we go. And that's more like it. Put that together. Okay. Next, we're going to 
turn this thing over. God, this thing's heavy. Jeez, oh, that's a good sign, actually. It should be a, a lot of iron there. I believe the stove weight is 110 pounds, so it's little, but it's heavy. Um, but, you know, when you're talking about wood stove, thermal mass is something, and not really the spot in your tiny house you want to conserve by getting a really tin canny kind of wood stove. Um, so, yeah. Um, hey, there are people, finally, online. Um, hey there, Stephanie Simmons. Um, good, thanks for the, thanks for the, um, feedback there. I appreciate it when people tell me if you can see me or not. Um, once in a while, um, streaming video out here in the country is a little janky. So. Okay, so anyway, you guys can shoot me your questions. Um, and uh, I will answer them. Um, so, there is... three legs, and I'm going to put the uh, rear guard on this while I'm waiting for questions. Oh god, it's heavy. Um, here is a rear guard. It has a placard that gives some specs on the wood stove. Um, I have to leave those on because they tell you some really important stuff like Heat clearance or clearances to combustibles. Um, okay, here we go. Need the socket that fits this now. Smaller. Oh dear. Well, this is metric, so we're gonna switch over to metric. I'm right here, picking out sockets. Maybe it's this one, no. Nope. 10, mil 10 millimeters is a very, it, for some reason there's so many screws in the world that are 10 millimeters. If you ever work on a car, you will really need your 10 millimeter wrench. There we go. Okay, so it's interesting the rear shield doesn't really cover the whole back of the stove, but it must not radiate from up here. Um, so what shields do on stoves is they stop some of the some of the heat radiation that comes off of the stove, and that's what is that's what you're worried about for clearances. Um, is the stoves will have a rated clearance, and Often you, in a tiny house, will do a, a reduced clearance insulation where you put um, a metal shield on the wall on non-combustible standoffs, which is, you know, kind of something like this, um, that spaces at a certain distance off the wall. And what that does is it um, allows more heat to be radiated from the stove, or, you know, it allows the heat from the stove to radiate to the heat shield and then vent as hot air behind it. Um, but don't um, do your homework and different stoves all have different clearances. So anyway, if, you, if this is something that's part of your reality, um, don't uh, mess around with wood stove specs and clearances. And if you have never put together a chimney before, um, I recommend getting a professional to help you. Um, Again, that's that's where um, uh, you know you can burn down your whole house uh, if you don't do it right. So um, anyway, so let's see. Um, Brooke Richardson asks: Is there a section of Olympia where it's not uncommon to find tiny houses, perhaps ones that you've created? Um, there isn't a section of Olympia. Um, there are tiny houses of mine around 
town. More of them are scattered out into the world. I have tiny. I have several of them in Portland, and actually now I have several of them in Seattle. Um, the one I just completed, which is a, um, let's see if I can swivel the right way, which is a. Uh, um, oh, this light's a little, little bright. My camera doesn't know quite what to do with it. Um, I, I completed a. Uh, a pinafore house, and it's in Seattle, up in like the Beacon Hill area, and uh, the woman that bought it is, uh, for now, putting it up on Airbnb. So if you want to see one of my houses, um, you know, stay in it, um, it'll, it's going to be up on Airbnb. I'll, I'll find a link to that listing and get it up on my website soon, um, but I, I couldn't find it yet the other day. I think she's just getting it established, um, but it may be up now as we speak. Um, she had it all prepped. Um, I just visited it the other day. So, um, yeah, yeah, I actually want to go stay in it myself. Uh, <laughs> this is kind of a, a charming thing to do. Um, but um, that's a pinafore house. Um, like I said, I have several in Seattle, several in Portland, and then the others are scattered to the wind. California, um, I think right now, uh, Wisconsin, uh, Colorado, uh, yeah, they're just all over the place. Um, and that's kind of how it goes. Um, Josh Fisher asks, is there a tiny home community in Olympia area? Um, there is one that I know of that's a, a homeless type community. So, um, uh, it, you know, it's built kind of under special rules. Um, and it's called Camp Quixote. Uh, and a group of a tiny house advocates and other local like homeless advocates uh, got the project together and it's really cool. Um, it's basically, I forget how many, I want to say there's like 20 um, small structures there and then there's a central like, community building that has a kitchen and bathrooms. So they kind of, the, the outlying buildings don't have their own utilities um, except for like electricity. Um, but super cool, um, there's actually a couple of those small um, tiny house things in Seattle, and I think there's one in Portland now, um, one or more, I'm not sure, so, um, but I, I keep hearing about them, and it's a really, really wonderful uh, thing for the homeless community. Okay. Um, Josh Fisher also asks, so what do you suggest for lightweight insulation when building a tiny home? Well, insulation by nature is usually pretty lightweight. Um, <laughs> there's not any that are um, a heck of a lot uh, heavier than others. Um, maybe, you know, I think I put in wool and maybe it weighed a little bit more than like fiberglass or, or um, foam. Uh, foam weighs a little more for the amount of area it occupies, but it has, um, depending on the foam, has higher insulated value. So um, my favorite foam would be polyiso type foam. Um, it has a higher insulated value. It's, it's also a little more expensive, but you, it's worth it, if that makes sense. Um, there's a bunch of other like styrofoams. They're basically cheaply produced. Um, and I don't know. As a builder, I, I don't tend toward using the cheaper foams because you you pay for the insulative value, so it's like, why not pay a little bit more and get a foam that performs better at a thinner, you know, at less thickness than, and is better, um, more long-lived materials, you know, so you don't have to recycle it so quick. Uh, anyway, that's my thought. So that's the foam part. I'm, I use foams for floors, but I also use it as a structural wrap. Uh, if I'm doing a double insulated type structure. Um, so uh, foam is an important building material these days just because it performs so well. Um, I don't, I know some people are going to have questions about this, but I don't tend to like blow in, you know, the, 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 the mix and foam in type foam. Um, it, foam in advocates say it outperforms anything, which isn't true, actually. Um, it does not outperform everything. Um, it uh, has some strong points, but uh, it can also be kind of a pain in the butt and create additional work in other parts of the build. So uh, it 
tends to be very expensive, like one of the most expensive forms of insulation. So that's, that's what, what's called blow-in or uh, not blow-in, but, uh, you know, foam-in or foam-in-place. Um, and uh, that is a kind of a polyurethane insulation um, when it's cured. It comes in like two parts and it's mixed into, uh, you know, and, and gunned into the house. And the best, the best applications are by professionals who have these huge machines that fit in the back of a truck. Um, and they, you know, suck it out, suck the, the ingredients out of 55 gallon <laughs> drums and foam it into your structure. So it, again, it's expensive, costs a lot because they have to bring a crew out to run the machine. Um, as far as like, you know, insulation you can buy in rolls, uh, fiberglass is really effective. It lasts forever. Um, it uh, is not toxic. Um, so, you know, that's cheap. It's l super lightweight. Um, if you, you know, put your walls together right, it doesn't settle. Um, so, yeah, that works fine. Um, there are many other types of insulation. Uh, lots of people like Roxel right now, which is a, you know, a mineral fiber insulation, and it's an industrial byproduct. And so, you know, again, I have a few feelings about that, but um, I do think it's effective, and, it, you know, it's fairly sustainable, I guess in the fact that it doesn't really biodegrade, so it lasts a long time. Um, okay. Uh, so would you suggest, Josh asks, would you suggest spray in to fill all the small gaps? Um, it is common to use, well, if you do your foam, if you're using like a foam sheet, I'm guessing that's what you're referring to, There, people tape the seams of foam. Um, there's always going to be some spots that you need to, fill in insulation. And if if it's inside the structure, you can use just about anything to fill in small gaps. You can press like what's known as backer rod. Um, that's a just kind of a small tubular kind of insulation into gaps around windows and stuff. Um, but um, uh, I don't have any of that handy. But um, oh, I'll show you some of the polyiso that I use. has foil on it. It's a polyisocyanurate foam, um, which isn't generally very tasty to rodents. Um, so it tends to hold up. It doesn't tend to get chewed on. And that is a really good thing. <laughs> um, and I actually don't put like belly pants. Some people put like aluminum pans on their house, but this already has aluminum on it. So you, and it saves you a step. Um, the other item. So if we're talking about filling in small gaps, um, you can use great stuff, which is a, like a polyurethane foam. Um, many people know that. Um, it's great. It's uh, a little expensive if you use a lot of it. Um, I'll go, I'll show you that. It's right. Here, this is great stuff. Interesting thing to know about great stuff is once you open it, and use the first bit of it, it tends to clog way down inside the can. There's not really any way to remove that clog. So if you're gonna use it, use a whole can at a time. Um, you know, you can't really like put it back on the shelf and then, you know, like you would a can of spray paint. Um, it, it clogs up after you use it once. So usually you use a whole can. Um, so as such for like little teeny teeny things, it can be a little expensive. Um, and that is great stuff. Um, Looks like I'm getting a good video rate. Um, I, what I'm going to do is I've got this little heater over there. I'm going to go start it for some, some reason it, it shut off. So um, be right back. Aha, uh -huh, got it. That should help a lot. Um, can you guys see me okay? Um, also, something that happened before is that... 
my screen gets off. Can you see me okay? I think I'm centered. Oh, there we go. It might be a little better. Um, I can see more of me now. Um, so, what were we, do were we talking about? Insulation and wood stoves. Um, I'm going to put this other part on the wood stove while we're um, waiting for more questions to come in. Um, I know some people sent me some questions recently, and I'm not... Uh, couldn't find them, so I apologize for that. Um, that that's that meaning the ones that were sent um, when. Oh boy. Yeah, so. Okay. Let's go at this another way. <laughs> Um, I am currently about to complete a, um, a little birdhouse, um, and I'm starting up another, a new design called, a, called the Fuchsia, um, and I will, um, I can show you guys a sketch of that if you're curious, um, oops. Um. I'm having a lot of fun here this spring with the new designs. Um, they're, uh, tiny houses are so funny to design for because there's like, since it has to go down the road, it, it's like this weird limiting box that you kind of have to build in. And um, I've always kind of thought that was weird and a little limiting, but you know, you just kind of make the best of that. Um, Although a lot of my round roosts are kind of um, expensive, as it were, um, to build. Aha, which leads me right into this question. Um, Herbert Sitz asks, what things do you do that you wouldn't suggest a beginner do? Like curved framing members, building your own windows, building cabinets or furniture, different materials. Aha, that is a great question. Um, thanks, Herbert. Um, yeah, I mean, there the simple like arched roof can be done fairly easily, um, but um, generally curved roofs are uh, a little complicated. Um, although there's something about just the straight arch roof that actually is slightly simpler than a roof that has a ridge pole, which means you know a center and like you know like a, a basically like a. a gabled, you know, type of roof. Um, so uh, if I could list the most notable things, I think, yeah, don't try to build windows for your first building project. Um, windows are pretty advanced. Um, you know, gosh, I'm still learning about my own windows, and uh, it's, I don't know, I've been building for 23 years. Um, and, and then some actually built would work when I was a kid, excuse me. But, um, you know, I've redesigned my sashes over and over. Um, wood window construction is not an easy thing. There's always some compromise and, uh, yeah, so don't, don't build your own windows. Um, they're really good windows, you know, even, I mean, I hate to say it, I, I don't like vinyl windows, but vinyl windows are completely functional um, and they're cheap. And that, you know, for a first-time project can kind of make them quite appropriate. Um, looking for used wooden windows. Wind, wood windows are expensive, no matter which way you look at them. Looking for used wood windows is um, an option. Uh, kind of have to know what you're looking for. Just look for something that looks like it's in impeccable condition. Because once you get to rebuilding them, or if there's no frame around the window and you're getting just the sash, uh, then you're engineering again. And... That's not easy to do. So, um, uh, also number of wind windows create um, structural concerns. So, you know, keep your windows simple. Um, huge windows and t uh, lots of windows all put together in a wall can create a structural concern that you have to address somehow by complicated framing, by metal straps. Um, anyway, so 
So that's one thing uh, that the, the, those things, you know, complicated roofs, uh, making your own windows. Um, I, if anybody wants to make their own cabinets, I would advise trying if you're into it. I mean, you could buy pre-made cabinets too. Um, there's plenty of, you know, actually Ikea makes really nice like they, they last a long time uh, so you can you can buy IKEA cabinets um, I guess it's probably better to buy some elements first for your first time around because what you'll find out is when you get into framing it's gonna be this learning process and it'll take you a while to get it all together um, probably a lot longer than you think um, a lot of people if they're building their first tiny house that they've never built before I say gosh give yourself it if you don't have Another job to worry about, give yourself four or five months to get like the shell built. Um, if you are trying to do it weekend warrior style, um, meaning that you're working a full-time job and trying to build a tiny house for the first time ever, give yourself a year or more. Just don't be hard on yourself about timeline. And I know that sounds like a lot, but it, it's true. A house takes a lot of time and energy and money to build correctly. Well, it doesn't have to take a lot of money, but it can. Because it's, sometimes it's it's worth it to use the right materials first, first time around, then to kind of go into it without what you need. Um, okay. Anyway, so, um, but building cabinets is not a hard thing to do. That's you're you know you're cutting plywood and fastening it together with some screws, and there's no you know if you don't quite get it right, there's no loss there. You can redo it. You can take it out and take it apart and redo it. You know you can. So no big deal. Okay, uh, I'm going to take another question. Uh, Josh Fisher ac asks, are there any weight restrictions when building or special permits for transporting your tiny home? Um, weight restrictions. Um, the only real... Okay, I can absolutely answer that question. So let's see here. Um, the only real weight restrictions there are when transporting a tiny house are... Um, First, the trailer itself. Um, I'm going to move around. Because <laughs> um, it's really beautiful out here today. Um, and I'm just going to see how my... Uh, the trailer itself will determine... Tiny house, how about that? Um, just because it's pretty. Um, you probably want to, don't want to build all the way to the capacity of your trailer because you may add some things as you go along. So that's the first weight restriction. Is your trailer a 10,000 pound trailer or a 12,000 pound trailer? Um, that will determine your weight. And if you don't know, you may have to guess and go weigh it before you go out on the highway. And if for some reason you got that really wrong, so here's, here's kind of what happens. There's not, nothing's insurmountable. If you got the, the load of the trailer off and it's a bit overweight, like a couple thousand pounds overweight, then you'll probably end up buying, you'll be replacing the axles with more capable ones and you'll probably be beefing up the tongue of the trailer, which none of it is insurmountable. Um, you know, steel is there to be welded. <laughs> so, uh, and welding isn't cheap, but it's, um, there's welders everywhere that can service a trailer like that. Um, just make sure their experience is what they're doing and not just like, a welder right out of well there might be some great welders in the college shop but you know anyway um, make sure they know what they're doing when it comes to the trailer loads because that is important out on the highway um, special permits to transmit your t transport your tiny home uh, you usually don't need any permits unless you're over size and for me that always is just the width um, I, I don't go over height that's that's a really pain in the butt because it besides a permit you need to file like this kind of trip checklist, um, a waypoint list, you know, it kind of tells like what overpass, what, when you have to, oops, my rate is going way down because I'm out here, and so I'm gonna come back into the shop. Um, but like when you have to exit the highway because there's an overpass that's too low and stuff like that. So going over height is not much of much fun. It's better to find a different way to do that. Um, but going over width is not that hard to do, and pardon me, I'm going to, um, there we go. Going over width is, I'm just going to wait for a moment. I see that I'm having a rate, uh, losing rate big time here. 
and comes back up. Okay, I'm just barely, barely running um, uh, my stream here, so um, I think you can see me again. Um, so um, going over width is no big deal, and you get an over, you put an over wide sign on your house, and you get a permit for it. And it's, um, you know, if you don't move your house very often, that that might be worth it to you to go 10 feet wide. Um, you can go up to about 12 before it starts to get complicated. So, yeah. Anyway, so that's thing about permits. Um, let's see. Uh, Emily Witt asks. Going on to the next question here. Emily Witt asks. Uh, can you tell me about the hanging loft in the Xenia house, please? They use two by fours to support the bed. Okay, we want to do a hanging loft to help decrease the amount of space loft supports take up. So, um, yeah, I did a hanging loft there. Um, it is not supported by the wood, actually. It's supported by a, a long steel rod with threads on each end. Um, <laughs> there you are. Um, it's supported by a long steel rod that I bore. I, I, I sent through the ridge pole. So there's, uh, you know, the roof, the main beam and the top of the roof. There is a, um, let me clean my lens. I think I'm dirty over here. Getting this funny fuzziness. Um, that's better. <laughs> dirty lenses. Um, uh, there's a bolt that holds up the front corner of the loft. The loft is partially cantilevered, which means the wall of the bathroom supports it somewhat, but it goes out a little too far to be fully supported by that extension of the loft. Um, so there's a steel rod attached to the corner, and my usually all the little sideboards on my loft are structural, which is a trick that I play as a, as a woodworker and a builder. Most builders don't do this, but I make thy sideboard structural. It means you have to attach them to each other and to the walls in the proper way. And I use types of wood that can hold a load. Um, so the structural sideboards have a, a bracket that holds the bolt that goes through the beam up in the roof. And there's a nut on top. Like if you take the, the top of the roofing off, there's a nut in the top of the roof that, that and then we put the nut on and then we peen the nut so it cannot ever come loose. And now the loft is suspended by a steel rod. Um, I did build a little wood post that has a, a route in the middle and encloses a steel rod. So that is how I did that magic trick of suspending the loft. Um, it's a little bit of work, but it's something I love to do. Um, next question. Emily Witt, any suggestions on how to start a company that builds tiny houses, shells, or completed homes? <laughs> how did you start? Okay, um, I have been building for something like 23 years. So first, I had building experience. Um, I would be really hesitant to start to run into the tiny house industry without having some building experience so you know how to make a build run efficiently and solve all the problems that come up with a house. It, you're building a small version of a house, so it's very complex. Um, yeah, um, I also, I, I have the kind of a strange story. You know, I built my entire business by hand. I Each part of my shop I gradually built, and add, so it was this long, gradual process of adding in pieces as I needed it. Um, so I, you know, more or less I own my whole business outright. I don't have loans to pay for, so my overhead is kind of low, you know, but it's getting into managing a business, and um, I don't know if I'd, I'd advise taking the same path, you know, some people can want to get a loan to start a business and kind of take care of some of the elements right away, and that actually can save you time, and then start turning your profit a little sooner, but you have to pay off the loan, you know, so I don't know if I could advise anything in particular for starting a business. You just have to really, like, I've worked, I've had major parts of my life where I've worked like 55 or 60 hours a week. So that's part of it. You know, you just, you, you have to be willing to be a small business owner and like, you're the last person in line to like make sure everything works and to make sure that a paycheck gets sent out or that you get 
your bills paid or whatever, you know, so that means you are going to work extra as a small business owner. Um, there's just no way uh, really around that. There's no magic bullet. Um, also, a tiny house industries, it's competitive and there's some really good builders out there. So, you know, unless you kind of have a really clever niche, um, you're going to be competing with all the other upstart builders that are going to keep popping up in the tiny house industry. So there you go. Um, it's, it's, it's really hard and it's, it's really difficult because it's, it, it, tiny houses, as you know them or that I know them, are in this gray zone with rules. So it's not a totally predictable, you know, there's some risks to the future, you know, the future has its little bit of risk. So like the rules may change in a subtle way and I might just have to throw in the towel for part of my business and do something else. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll zig or I'll zag if I have to because I've always kind of done that. Like maybe I'll start making windows only or, you know, maybe I'll quit and become an electrician. You know, again, I have did that before. Um, but uh, there you go. You have to be quick on your feet to stay alive as a small business person. Um, so there you go. You guys got a little too much information about me. <laughs> um, and yeah, I started with like a tool bag and nothing. A tool bag and nothing is how I started building houses. And the people around me, I, I went looking to the builders in my community and I started building little remodels um, in town. I built furniture. I, I did a boat restoration. That's kind of how I got started doing building. Um, and it's been many, many years of really hard work and not much money. <laughs> not rich. Look at my truck. My truck is old and beat up. It works, but though. Um, uh, thank you guys for the feedback about the picture. Um, wow, the, the ray got really slow there. Um, here's a good question. Jedediah Stevens asks, do you use steam to achieve all the curves in your builds? Um, I don't. Um, I can do steam bending. I've done it, but it's a very labor-intensive process. It requires the absolutely correct kind of wood. It's like, so it's a little antiquated. Um, it's not. I think steam bending will continue to be used as a, as a technique um, as woodworking in the future goes on, but it's uh, impractical for building houses, I think. Um, again, I, I do occasionally do a pseudo steam bend for a trim or something, but I don't build my structures with steam bending because it's, it requires a big steam tank and a bunch of fuel and steam and like exactly perfect like wood with no knots. And that's getting harder and harder, harder and harder to find. It's a resource that's becoming very rare and I love rare wood as a woodworker, but I don't exactly seek it or want to think that it's going to be there 10 years from now. Um, I would rather see those old trees grow and stay standing, the old growth trees, and no more of them get cut, and I will happily use, you know, so I'm just, you know, giving my take as a woodworker in the industry of wood, and I, I do need a lot of raw materials to build houses, especially we're handcrafting everything. Uh, but I'll take young growth, knotty wood. Um, we'll just change our techniques. That's all. We just keep changing our techniques. Steam bending doesn't go really well with modern woods um, with a few small exceptions. So there you go. I don't use steam bending. Um, what is your favorite part of the build? Oh my gosh. Uh, I guess designing can be... The, the initial designing can be really, that's not true. It's all kind of fun. It's, it's all this like roller coaster ride. Um, initial design is really fun. Um, but it's also a bunch of like time at the computer, which is not as much fun. <laughs> um, you know, because I'm, I'm talking to the client a whole bunch to try to figure out what they want and when and how and where and what it's going to look like and how much it's going to cost. So there's then there's the budget stuff goes along with design. So it's design, budget, design, budget. And then uh, sourcing materials and then running the framing crew um, or framing. 
I should say. <laughs> now that I'm like the owner of the, the business and I have a few um, carpenters that work with me, I, part of my role is that I'm making sure the crews are fed and watered, so to speak. So I am the assistant for everything, you know, fixing tools, and I'm making sure the crew has what they need and not so much swinging the hammer, um, so to speak. Actually, we don't swing many hammers here. We use air nailers. Okay, well, anyway, um, but I also really like the finish part of the project, like doing the checklists. It's also stressful to do the checklists, and you know, because sometimes you'll find out there's something that needs to get fixed or repaired, and you have to get a part in, and there's not, like, not quite enough time, and you know, so there's like this little deadline thing that happens right at the end. Um, that's okay. I try not to, <laughs> I try not to have deadlines so that I can get everything dialed in exactly, perfectly perfect. And that being said, nothing's ever perfect. Um, but, uh, yeah. Uh, so I, I can't tell if I have an exact favorite spot. Uh, Jedediah Stevens asks, so you use jigs. How do you do it? I do not use jigs. I now use computers. Um, I use, a, a, I, I use a, a computer router. It's right here um, to cut most of my curved stuff. Uh, this is my CNC machine. Here's the computer that controls it. Um, there's a spindle. That's not a router. That's a spindle. Um, this is this amazing thing. Um, here's the dust extractor. That's really important. Here's the, uh, the VFD. This is really important. Everything's off because it's the weekend, which is the way I like it. <laughs> But this, um, here's the other control module, a whole bunch of electronics in there, and that is a CNC machine. It's got these tracks that the, um, the gantry rolls on, and um, you can load entire sheets of plywood in this and cut them to the shapes you want. And see, there's a, or the cutting board on top of it right now, but here is, uh, a, a wood stove platform that we cut out of a piece of plywood um, and then we covered it with metal um, turning around I do use jigs also sometimes for some things I use lots of techniques actually so the computer is one of them uh, jigs are another Okay, let's see. Herbert Sitz says, here in Washington, allowed to live in RVs no more than 120 to 180 days a year. Do you have to hide things from the county? Um, well, since tiny houses are not really RVs, um, I don't think that's a problem. Um, <coughs> They're sometimes considered RVs, but I don't build them to RV standards, and I do not label them as RVs. So there you go. Um, that makes a little bit of a difference. Uh, sorry, I'm just sitting here with my hand in my pocket because it's cold. Um, there are most places is legal to own and use a tiny house on wheels. Um, it's a little harder in an urban area because there are rules about having things on your land and where and having enough parking spaces and stuff like that. But um, again, it's not impossible in an urban area, excuse me. Um, but like, you know, out in the county, um, you can own in most places, like I said, most places you can own and use something like a tiny house on wheels. It is, as of yet, until some of the IRC stuff goes through, which is in the works, it's in the works, it's difficult to label a tiny house as a uh, your primary residence. Um, so that is an important point. Um, so you, you can't like have a blank piece of land and plop a tiny house on wheels in the, you know, what, what we're talking about here, these like sub 200 square foot little things on it and say, this is my, this is my house now and the county 
will say, no, no, that can't qualify as a house. But otherwise, it's not a big deal. If you're not breaking any other rules by using it, then they kind of just exist. And um, eventually, and, and there are other places, you, so you, they, they sometimes get used as an RV. And a tiny house, for example, if you go park, uh, I have one of mine is over in Bonnie Lake in an RV park. A really nice little RV park. There's several other tiny houses there, um, and there's RVs. Um, and in a place like that, uh, it's regarded as an RV. The RV park doesn't care that it's certified or not. Um, some may, and some don't. You know, so like the, the story is different in different places. But there's an example of one getting used as an RV. It's not really an RV because it's built to residential standards. So. Um, uh, that's another way that they can be used openly and freely and on the table. So, uh, and then there are places where it really is just okay to, to, you don't need a building permit for small structures or houses. And that's, you know, Vermont and Kentucky. And there's places where you just kind of can do what you want if you're not breaking other rules. You know, see, it's, it's, a, all, it's a similar story, but different in different places. Um, there's a town in Texas I just learned about, Spur, Texas. Spur, I believe that's the name. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. And they uh, just decided, we're welcoming tiny houses. Bring them here if you have one. Um, yeah, you can buy a parcel in town. It's affordable. Um, the only rule is you take the axles off and put it on uh, foundation blocks or foundation. Um, but other than that, bring your tiny houses. And they, like the town, actually just decided to do this. They have a population of like 900 people or something. And that's great. Um, I think that's really cool. Um, and so, uh, you know, and it's, it's out, it's a little town in Texas, so it's its, its own thing. And, um, you know, so different stories, different places. Um, you know, I wouldn't expect that to happen, like, right around the corner from Seattle here, up in the Northwest, where people are a little more hooty tooty and there's more money. But um, a place like that, that's, that's awesome. Um, Fresno did a thing where they would allow a tiny house to be used as an accessory dwelling unit in town. Um, I don't know the current status of that, but when it first happened, um, they were allowing them to be sited. You had to keep it in the same spot for a couple of years. I think you had to skirt it. You know, so tiny house on wheels, you can apply to have to use it as an accessory dwelling unit, for mother-in-law cottage, so to speak, and um, put it in town. Uh, so there's another example. Um, but again, there's lots of kind of, you know, soft use that happens. Ah, um, okay, uh, uh, one, I'll take one. Uh, I'll answer the next two questions, and then I'm going to wrap it up, because I just realized what time it is, and I actually have to take this gimbal that the phone is on to my friend, Red, who's doing a photo shoot. I probably probably a music video for God's sakes, um, but he wants a piece of my photo equipment, um, so I'm going to take it to him downtown Olympia. Um, but I need to wrap it up anyway. So, um, Jedediah Stevens um, says again uh, in response to the, the the asking about cutting curves, and I and I, I show my CNC machine. I said I do it with computers now. Um, again, that's me. I don't recommend people run that direction unless you really want to do that because CNC is a huge thing. It's expensive, long learning curve, um, but wonderful tool, um, wonderful creative tool. Um, but Jedediah Stevens says, for somebody, somebody wanting to do that stuff without a computer cutter, you just have to use a jigsaw. Uh, yeah, yeah, I did. I use a jigsaw. I still use a jigsaw day in and day out, and um, I, that's how I did it for years. I would make... I would lay out patterns as a boat builder would, like I'd, I'd, I'd screw down like two pieces of plywood and I'd draw the rafters or the shape of what I was trying to do and I'd extrapolate the other projections of the raft. It gets, it gets, it gets messy, uh, but it's really fun. It's called lofting. I extrapolate all the different rafters of the roof that I want and I would draw them out and I'd transfer them to, to secondary patterns and I'd cut those out and I make sure they were perfectly smooth in the shape that I wanted, and then I trace patterns and cut them out with jigsaws. You can, you can make a lot of cool things that way. Um, so, yes, jigsaw. Um, and uh, 
put a lot of miles on my jigsaw. I still have my original one. It's a Bosch. And they made an update to it, and the update does not hold a candle to so the original. The update broke. The original's still running 10 years, 12, 13 years later. <laughs> I'll show you that stuff. Thirteen-year-old Bosch jigsaw. Its name is Vibert, uh, named after a famous Olympia like historical photographer. Um, but uh, anyway, this is my number one jigsaw, and it's still alive and kicking. Um, and we've replaced the foot on it once. That's it. Um, and so the next one that I was going to answer is Michael Johnson's last inquiry. Gosh, I always get asked about this. Any experience with the Tesla Powerwall and solar? Um, yes, I have. I designed solar systems from the ground up. I do not have experience with Tesla Powerwall because it's not commonly available yet. And I feel like the technology, the, the theoretical capability of that hasn't quite caught up to... Anyway, it's getting there. But... Um, it's, it's not a golden bullet yet, so I don't know. I know about Tesla Powerwall. I use other types of batteries for now until, until I think that the Tesla thing is like hit ground. Then I'll, I'll go for it. <laughs> I usually take a little, you know, little while to get, to get around to things. New, new technology things get really um, uh, uh, these days with the internet, things get very um, Uh, they, they're, they're flourished on the media in a way that it's hard to tell if they're going to be effective or affordable or anything, excuse me, right away, so that uh, things like the Tesla Powerwall has all this buzz going around it, and, um, you know, we really have to wait until we see some really good practical systems in use for a little while, and then you can say, yeah, that's... That's a doable option. When you're building a solar system um, and you're looking for storage options, um, it's a pretty high demand as far as like engineering wise. Um, you're building something that's going to be used day in and day out, hopefully for a long time in those like industrial lead acid batteries right now will last for 10 or 12 years. That's a long duty cycle and they're recyclable at the end of that. So, you know, there's like, there's some pretty potent and usable stuff that's already existing. Uh, it has, they have a lot of punch. You know, people, I, those little solar kits that people are getting with AGM batteries, you know, they just don't have the capacity of a hand designed system with, with an industrial battery bank um, that costs about, the, you know, sometimes you can spend the same for these little kit solar systems as, you know, like I can, I can make one for the same price and it has sometimes twice the battery capacity and twice the solar um, gain capacity because I'm using like industrial quality components. Um, an electrical system is a really demanding thing. Um, so yeah, it's not like you're, you're trying to make something that's going to stay, that, that is safe to start out with and remain safe for a long time. And you're, you're basically building yourself a small electrical power plant, which is no small task and that's why like my basic solar system costs like about eight thousand dollars um that's one that'll run a tiny house with quite a few appliances refrigeration all that um reliably for you know the battery bank will last 10 to 12 years the other components will last longer than that um so um anyway it's it's a it, quite a bit of technology packed in there and quite a bit of uh uh electrical equipment so Small electrical power plant. That's one way to think about it. Okay. Um, uh, all right, I'm going to wrap it up. Thanks for the thanks for all the questions, you guys. I really appreciate it. Um, I really appreciate you joining me again. Um, I'm here for do-it-yourselfers. Um, so uh, most mostly, I'm here for the do to support do-it-yourselfers um, and not any other reason. Um, it's just something I've been wanting to do, and uh, 
I'll answer as many questions as I can um, based on my experience in the tiny house world for um, the last, um, you know, 10 plus years. Um, I've been building tiny houses for about eight years or so, so, um, but um, I've kind of seen them on the rise before I ever started building them. So uh, anyway, uh, join me next week at 10.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, it's called Ask Zill Live. Um, I will um, do this every week um, as I can. And once in a while I may have a, a family event or something and I'll skip it, but I will let you know. And um, subscribe to my YouTube channel and you can hear about those and you can hear announcements about my upcoming live streams and any tiny house tours that I put up. I've got a whole bunch that I'm working on right now. I have all this like video footage. Um, I'll get this stuff up soon, but I've just been too busy building to post anything. So <laughs> there you go. Anyway, um, have a really lovely rest of your weekend and we will see you guys again soon.